The 2025 hurricane season is just around the corner and we wanted to take a moment to talk with some experts in the Florida area to tell us what they're expecting as we get into the season. I'm Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb at WXIA TV in Atlanta. Joining me today is Bobby Deskins, also the Chief Meteorologist in Tampa, and then Tim Deegan is the Chief Meteorologist in Jacksonville. Both of these guys. Hello, gentlemen. Very important, but I want to point out Tim really quickly because we have the honor of getting Tim <laughs> as he is just about to retire and Tim you have got that expertise and knowledge and wisdom about these Atlantic storms here tell me again how long have you been in Jacksonville as chief there well first of all I appreciate all your wordings the weather, the weather team uses way <laughs> other stuff like uh, old tired of hearing you talking uh, that kind of stuff so, uh, so I started in January of 82, so uh, 43, 43 hurricane seasons. I'll leave you with one other fact, and I really hadn't thought about this until someone asked me a couple days ago, how many shows have I done, they, they asked me. And I said, what do, you, what do you count as a show? And they said, well, 30 minute shows. And I said, well, uh, over 40,000, wow. I have about, I have about wow. 67 left, so. So as you can tell, for I'm those actually, of you I'm watching, actually, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I got to do it because I was I was born a weather freak, and I suspect I will I will be one when I paddle out to the ocean on that final day, oh, whenever yeah. that happens. Good for you, and, and you know, so that just it reiterates Tim's experience there along the Atlantic side. And then Bobby, you have been working in along the Gulf side there in Tampa for a long time too, and you guys definitely feel those impacts from those Gulf storms there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I've been here about 17, 18 years, and time before that was up on the Carolina coast, so a little bit of the Atlantic storms. Uh, and then a lot of them come here through the Gulf and over Jacksonville, over Georgia, sometimes Atlanta, and then right up towards the Carolinas. So, yeah, it's, uh, you never know when you're going to get a storm, right? But we do know in the Gulf here, we've kind of looked towards the first part of the season, even in May, May and June, as things can start in the Gulf or down in the Western Caribbean and come up and add us. And then later in the seasons, we start to get those longer track storms. But, you know, the, the, one of the keys about here in the Gulf is the water and the loop current and that warm water and storms moving over top of it can rapid intensify. And that's something that we always watch for here. So it's kind of, you know, you're, you think you got a plan, right? But that's not the plan until the plan changes type of thing here. And we're going to break down some of those impacts that we're going to be watching for and some of the signals that we as meteorologists look for as we're going into the hurricane season. But before we get to that, I just want to show everybody just the general uh, look at what we see here. So let's take a look at that graphic here where the season begins on June 1st. We typically peak on September 10th and then it's downhill after that or it starts improving a little bit after that where the season ends at the end of November there on November 30th. And, you know, Tim, Bobby mentioned that there are times here when we typically think of the really active time of hurricane season being there in August and September in, in what we call the Cape Verde season when we get those storms coming off the coast of Africa. And yes, we need to watch for that. But Bobby talked about there, there are times early season when we not only see some development that could be in the Gulf, but I know a lot of times in the early season there off of the Florida coast and the Carolina coast, we could see that early development. Yeah, absolutely. In, in fact, uh, we've been talking about wondering about what might happen in the Caribbean come mid-May. And, and what we're really focused on is what we call the Central American gyre. Yes. And, um, and does it mean that there's always going to be a tropical cyclone form? Uh, but those gyres tend to form early in the season and late in the season. And right to your point about off the southeast coast, if the ocean warms up, and it is. Uh, I was in the water today. It's already 77 degrees here, 77 degrees off the coast of Georgia in early May. Uh, but very often, not very often, but if it's going to happen early May, possibly June, is when we see frontal systems stall over that part of the world. And then the subtropical jet stream lifts off to the north. You don't have any shear. And if the low can stir there, it can, it can cause some problems. Now, typically, those aren't don't become major hurricanes, but as we all know, and, and you guys experience this uh, certainly in Atlanta and surrounding areas, that a system doesn't have to be a hurricane or doesn't have to be any longer a hurricane to still produce tragic flooding. Uh, and so, so yeah, so although it's just May with the oceans being warmer, those are those are the two areas we, we focus on. Um, certainly the Central American gyre, but then also might something form on a front 
uh, the energy aloft above the front leaves, and then, um, and then, and then we're left with the low. I got, I got to say one more thing real quick. Uh, it's almost tougher for me to talk with this group setting amongst fellow meteorologists because, because we're used to, a uh, little inside baseball, because we're used to being in front of the camera and, and the, uh, the, the producer, right gang, is telling us we have less than two minutes to go, right? <laughs> and, 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 and so therefore, I, I'm, I'm taught to be very concise. With this group, I think I could probably talk to you guys for hours. So yes. I'm really trying yep. to, to edit my conversation. Uh, if you got a cane, just you know, yank the cane on my neck and I'll, I'll shut up. And we can be as nerdy, weather nerdy as we want here as well. You know, we were talking about those um, water temperatures and we know that the oceans are warming. This year, are y'all seeing any differences in those water temperatures? It seems like they might be a little bit lower this year compared to where we were at this time last year, but even if they are a little bit lower, it's still well above the average and these warmer waters, that's what fuels these storms and makes them stronger. Many of the areas I have an opinion now there, but Bob, Bobby, where we go ahead. Look Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, many of the areas this time of year that we look, Western Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, they are warmer than normal, uh, which has basically now become the norm, to be honest yes. with you. Yeah. But if you look out in the central and eastern part of the Atlantic, at least for right now, there's kind of a cool pool of, of water there, at least cooler than normal. Uh, and, and last year at this time, that was warmer than normal. So if anything, that's a small sign that it may help us as we get into the, the heart of the season, August, September, October. But that's so far between now and then that that can change. But it is a good sign right now looking at, at that and comparing to what we saw last year because the forecast numbers wise is pretty similar this year to what we had last year. Yeah, and we'll go ahead and take a look at some of those numbers that are, come from Colorado State. Now, NOAA will release their outlook really at the end of May, but Colorado State usually issues early outlooks. And they're saying uh, on average, we normally have 14. They're predicting 17 named storms. On average, we would have seven hurricanes. They're predicting nine. On average, we would have three major categories uh, major major hurricanes at category three or higher, but they're predicting four. Um, first off, let me ask you guys: Do you like these outlooks? Because when <laughs> when they come out saying you know below average, then people are like, oh okay, it's below average. I don't need to worry. We need to still watch the season no matter what. And even these numbers are predicted are a little bit lower than what they were predicting last year. But again, this is still above the average. So Tim, what are your thoughts on these early outlooks? Yeah, so two main, two main points. Um, first of all, you got to remember, uh, and I know you know this, Chris, uh, but, but for those watching and listening, that that is a moving 30-year average. For instance, when I started in 1982, we averaged only 11.5 name storms and only 1.5 major. So what is now considered uh, slightly above average, if we had had that forecast back in 1982, uh, we would have been saying well <laughs> above average. So just as a reminder to folks that, that um, the oceans are warming, if for no other, if, if you know, we use any other definition, that just means there's more potential energy, but that means that 30 year average is moving as well. So, I, so at least here in the first coast, I really try to be careful with folks about that term average. Secondly, I agree with you that all it takes is one. If I've said it once, I've said it a million times. We can go back to 1992 mm -hmm. and Andrew, did not form seven until name August. So think about this. Nothing formed until August. We only had seven. And I guarantee you, I still hear stories like it was yesterday for folks who fortunately lived through that hurricane. So you're absolutely right. And we could go through the list. We could talk about um, Alicia back in 83 and, and, and all kind of years where, where it only takes one. Um, but I, I understand why folks like to see uh, the overall averages. I do think there's some, you know, there's some peer reviewed science to it. But, but the big, for me, uh, what I was hoping we would see in science from the 80s and 90s is that eventually we'd get to the point where we could say, okay, here's whether we think it's gonna be above or below, who do we think has the highest risk? Personally, I know we're attempting that. I really haven't seen much peer reviewed stuff that takes it to, okay, uh, that means it's gonna be bad for Bobby or it's gonna be bad for Atlanta. Um, I, I, th I think we all take sort of a gander into that next step, but at least personally, I don't think we're quite there yet. And then Bobby, what and do you Chris, think about I think those, to, those early predictions? To, I think what you were almost trying to get at too was that they're just a forecast. And it's just, I don't, it's not random, right? There's a lot that goes into it, but it's 17 name storms is the forecast now from Colorado State. This time last year was 18. 
they have nothing to do with where the storms go. It's just the amount of energy in the atmosphere at the end. So there's a couple, there's a bunch of different things that go into it. But those are just numbers of how busy we will be tracking storms. Then you can start looking at other things like where that high pressure is going to be out over the Atlantic. And this year actually looks like it could be a little bit further to the east, which may quiet the Gulf a little bit and open up the East Coast a little bit, but it's still even that's so far out in town, uh, out in time. It's just that when we do get these forecast numbers, we know that we're going to have to give these to the folks at home and we don't want them to get too too much anxiety about the season, especially here in the Gulf Coast. We just got hit twice. Well, three hurricanes here, two of them really bad here uh, last year. And so coming out with numbers on the backside of all that, people really just don't even want to hear about it. But it doesn't mean mm -hmm. that we're going to get hit. By the way, uh, Hurricane Andrew it was only seven named storms we said yeah. that year. That changed the building codes in the state of Florida. It was so bad. Yeah, you know, we, we, we've, we've mentioned a lot of meteorological terms here. We talked about the, uh, the, the loop current, the Central American gyre. We, we, and so we just talked about too, this, we, we often talked about La Nina and El Nino. We are in a neutral pattern this year, meaning that it's not El Nino and it's not La Nina. As you guys see that with your experience, what does that tell you about the season? Well, um, two, I, I go to two levels here again. One is, in my opinion, and I think we've seen a, a little bit of peer review, is that as significant as El Nino and La Nina, and of course neutral being in between, as significant as they are, um, I think I personally think, whereas they were probably the headline in the 80s and the 90s, by 2010, again, in my opinion, once the oceans, and not just at the surface, but you know, we're getting better at measuring down to about 200 meters. Um, once those levels reached higher as an average globally than we've ever seen, I think that, um, that is now more of the headline than whether it's La Nina and El Nino. And I think over the last 10 to 15 years, as much as we've seen variations, even on the years that let's say 30 years ago, in which we would have an El Nino, we'd have maybe single digit, maybe 10 named storms. I mean, even on the quiet years now, we're getting into the teens. And I think it has a lot to do with the ocean temperatures. With that said, uh, yeah, to me, uh, neutral, neutral is, Unfortunately, we don't have as much of the inhibitor that El Nino normally produces, and maybe you guys can, can talk about the whole shear factor. Yeah. And in fact, if, if you look back at some hurricane years, we've actually had some of our worst years during uh, a neutral year. Now, when I say we, I'm saying that term generally speaking. That doesn't mean Tampa, <laughs> doesn't mean Jacksonville, doesn't mean Atlanta, but just overall the Atlantic base. As Tim was saying the water, the warm water, because it, what happens is, is generally, and not all the time, but generally during La Nina, we will have more, less wind shear in the atmosphere, which means we can make more storms. They don't shear those thunderstorms apart as they start to grow. And during El Nino, we, we have more wind shear, so we tend to have less storms. Now that comes and goes throughout the season, those effects. You don't have shear the whole time. You don't have a lack of shear the whole time. But in between those ebbs and flows is when you can make storm. And under, underneath of all of that is the warmer temperature. And, and that warm water makes the better chance for those thunderstorms. So even with, and I, I totally agree with Tim, the, the way that water's gotten warmer, it's made it less more of a point of El Nino versus La Nina just because we can have development in between. Yeah. The bottom line with tropical seasons, especially here in the Atlantic, that's mother's, mother nature's way of taking the heat in the ocean, boiling it up, and transferring it to the northern latitudes. Yes. It's a natural cycle. The warmer we get, the more bubbling up, trying to transfer to the northern latitudes that you're going to get. It's, it's just transporting that, that energy uh, within the atmosphere there and, and globally as well. So Tim and Bobby, thank you guys so much. We do have to wrap right now, but this is gonna be a long season. And Tim, I know that the folks in Jacksonville are gonna be missing you after your retirement, that you will not be there for this hurricane season. But Bobby, I know that we'll be talking to you a little bit more also as we go through the season. So for both of you, stay safe down there in Florida on both coasts as we are gonna be entering hurricane season in just a little bit. Hey, thank you very much, and gentlemen, good luck this, this season.